Brass Monkey, a seriously fun control, was presented as part of the Flash in the City conference. This presentation was originally recorded on June 10th, 2011, in New York City. So how many of you guys actually saw my presentation last year? Or, okay, a few of you. All right, good. So some of you will be a little bit, um, it'll be a review, I guess. <laughs> um, so yeah, as you said, I run actually two companies. I run Infrared 5, and now we split off Brass Monkey as a separate business. Uh, it's a full-on platform for creating connected experiences and, and probably the most common use case is to turn the smartphone, um, like one of these, or a tablet or an Android device into a game controller. So you guys might know me from the Red 5 project. I worked with John Gurdon back in the day, and we started... Uh, this where we reverse engineered RTMP, um, which is the uh, streaming protocol for Adobe Flash. Uh, at the time, it was Macromedia. And um, I also started a company called Infrared 5 uh, from that. And uh, Infrared 5 has uh, grown into uh, quite a um, service-based company where we build cool stuff for a lot of different clients like Adobe, NBC, um, Lucasfilm and quite a few others. Uh, and in fact, two of our other guys, uh, Keith Peters and um, Todd Anderson, are also going to be speaking at this conference, and I highly suggest you go check out their sessions as well. Keith's talking uh, about building tools, and um, Todd is uh, doing a whole thing on jQuery, so it should be pretty exciting. Um, but alas, I've now started this new company called Brass Monkey, and we are getting a lot of traction right now, and it, this thing is uh, kind of taking off. We're still kind of going through a fundraising phase right now with it and um, building it up, and I'm gonna show you guys some new things that we're launching with it, which I think uh, all of you will be pretty excited about because uh, it means free to develop for, um, and people like free. So a lot of times I get asked, like, well, how did, how did you end up building all this stuff, and how did you get, to, how did you get here? And, you know, messing up or failing, I think, is a really important thing. Um, so I, I encourage you to try stuff because if you're failing, it means you're trying a lot. And for you coders out here, this is a, it represented in code for you. Um, for you non-coders, uh, Thomas Edison put it pretty well, and he said that um, I've not failed. I've only figured out a thousand different ways that it didn't work, and I think that's a pretty good way to look at it. Also, um, if you're kind of at a bad point in your career or whatever, you know, that's actually a pretty good thing. I, I actually lost my job as a beer salesman, and I started doing my hobby, which was making uh, web uh, sites uh, for my former clients. I started doing it for bars and restaurants, and this was in kind of right before the dot-com boom. So if you knew HTML5, they're like, hey, dude, you're hired. This is great. Um, so... That's kind of how I got into it, and I strongly uh, suggest looking at like downsides like that as big opportunities. Um, also, figure out problems. Like I said, with the Red 5 thing, that was a major problem. There were no alternatives to the Flash communication server at the time. So if you can figure out something that needs to be fixed, do it yourself. Uh, don't wait around to let other people do it for you. And um, if you can think about problems differently, that's probably a good thing, too. Also, work with great people. Um, this is uh, my wife, Rebecca. She's a business partner in Infrared 5, Dominic Akitato. And there's Keith Peters. Keith was our first employee. This is us um, hanging out at a bar in London. And um, I often look at uh, building a company as kind of like uh, building a band, because I'm a musician, too. So... Um, if you get really great people together, you can pretty much make great music. And same thing goes for building an open source project or a company or anything along those lines. So anyway, um, that's enough of my preaching. <laughs> uh, so if you of you saw my history of the internet uh, last year, it's been revised a little bit, but um, overall it's pretty much the same thing. And the reason I want to get into this is because it often it is important to understand where we came from in order to uh, see how we can move forward. And um, I think what we're doing with Brass Monkey and the whole user experience around it is really moving forward. But it's all based on internet protocols. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about the history of the internet. So it started back in ancient Rome, 
Actually, no, that it has nothing to do with it. I don't know what the slide's doing there. It's, it's actually a series of tubes. Everybody know about this? Series of tubes. I don't know if we have volume on this thing. Let's see if uh, Senator, Senator Ted Stevens can tell us. And again, the Internet is not something that you just dump something on. It's not a big truck. It's, it's a series of tubes. Right. So... It turns out it's a series of tubes. Um, <laughs> actually, it's not. It's, a, it's a, a network of connections, and they actually use wires to do this, not tubes. But um, the concept is kind of similar. You know, the idea was that we're going to share data between uh, endpoints. And uh, the reason we started this uh, was because we were paranoid of the Ruskies um, stealing all of our data. And so we needed to figure out a way to connect all of the universities uh, and uh, this is where DARPA started, and uh, this is a napkin drawing from 1969 of uh, kind of a diagram of how the internet was going to work. And they came up with a protocol called TCP, which is the Transfer Control Protocol, and this is essentially what the entire web is based upon. Although now you got UDP too, but um, also home computers uh, became more prevalent in the 80s. It allows you to connect to the internet via modems, um, and you can do things like play global thermal and nuclear war. And hack hackers were cool back then. You got hot girlfriends like this. How many of you guys know this movie? Yeah, war games. Yeah, but then the web came along, right? And we all know the guy who invented the web is this guy. Oh, actually, no, he invented the internet. I got to get this right. Um, and then this guy invented the web. This is Sir Tim Berners-Lee. Came up with HTTP and uh, HTML. And basically the idea was they were going to link documents all over the world, and this is going to become a grandiose plan, which actually did work out, but I don't think it kind of went the way he thought it was. Um, people started making all kinds of crazy stuff on top of this, and images and text weren't quite enough. So... Uh, people started making things like blink tags, uh, like Netscape did, adding that to the protocol and extending HTML to make it more interactive. Also, animated GIFs were a very um, important aspect of the early web and making it more interactive. And people started making their own home pages. This is a this is a fabulous one here, owed to this kitty cat. Um, also. You know, everything from religious groups, sorry if anybody suffers from, you know, like, bizarre light things and causing seizures or something. Um, and then advertising, of course, is a huge part of the web today. And uh, news. I mean, people consume news this way. Believe it or not, all of these websites are actually still live on the Internet today, which is uh, fascinating. That just shows you the breadth of the Internet. It's incredible. Um, but, you know, HTML by itself wasn't cutting it. So Java came along, and uh, well, some microsystems did, and introduced the Java applet. And this was supposed to be the answer to creating interactive content on web. And you could create effects like, you know, rippling water and, uh, you know, other particle effects as well. Something like, you know, check this out. This is snow. This is all Java applets. But, you know, just having, like, this kind of uh, non-interactive content is fine, but the really cool thing was that you could start, um, like, using your mouse to interact, like in this example with this kind of water effect. And as uh, we know in history, Flash kind of overtook uh, Java on this one, and, um, I, I, you know, they are still in the lead in terms of web plugin and can do really interactive stuff. So the Flash 4, I think, was when this really started turning, uh, it was kind of a turning point, this is when I got into Flash myself, and uh, it's really sophisticated. Of course, we know that everybody's saying that Flash is dead, uh, HTML5 and WebGL uh, are kind of taking over, and you know, to a certain extent, I think that's true. Uh, I think that uh, plugins are going to maybe wane a little bit, but of course, there's Unity. How many of you guys know about Unity 3D? All right. Yeah, it's a very sophisticated game platform. Uh, they also have a web plugin, uh, but they've also announced that they're going to be supporting Flash and uh, exporting to Molehill. And Flash is continuing to um, evolve as well. So you know, with the uh, really killer 3D um, capabilities, um, 
if you want to know a lot about that, you should check out Rob Bateman's talk on uh, Away 3D. They're showing some really cool stuff with that. Uh, and if, so that's kind of where we are today. And if you want a decent, um, probably a better version of the history of the internet than my really short one there, I would check out this video. Um, it's called The uh, History of the Internet. It's probably the first result you get if you Google it. Um, it's really cool. So that brings us to the future. What is the future going to look like in terms of the web? And I think you know the, the biggest thing here is it's not just surfing on a little uh, you know with your mouse and your desktop PC. It's actually multiple platforms, right? You guys follow me here, right? Mobile. That's a really huge segment of it. Um, smartphones in particular. Uh, Internet-enabled TVs, I think, you know, digital displays in general. And then, of course, the smartphone. And this is, uh, you know, the iPhone, the one that I think really kicked this off and created a new model for uh, the web. In particular, I think the smartphone is actually killing uh, a lot of other products, right? They, they're just like this little mouse is like a, an MP3 player. Think of it that way, you know. Um, there's lots of these little mice just getting trampled on, um, kind of like the light bulb uh, did to uh, take out, you know, lanterns and uh, gas-powered lighting. We're seeing the same thing today. Mobile games, for example, uh, they're all played on these devices. Uh, you know, you can even say the same thing is true with the uh, Nintendo DS and all of those uh, kind of PlayStation Portable and stuff like that. Also, I love this picture because this pretty much sums it up. There's like um, all of these devices here can be replaced with a smartphone. You got a digital camera. I mean, Flickr now, I guess the uh, second most used uh, camera on the Flickr uh, site is actually the iPhone 4, which says a lot. Um, of course, the MP3 player, the, camp the phone itself, um, and then the game console. And this is what we're, we're kind of focusing on. A multiplayer game sitting in front of a TV can actually be done with a smartphone now. So, games. How many of you guys saw the Wii U announcement last week? What do you guys think about that? It's cool, kind of, eh, we don't know. Well, this, uh, I mean, the, the, the response right now, I think, is kind of lackluster, but if you remember back when the original Wii was launched, gamers didn't really like that much either. They were like, oh, this is lame, who's going to be doing this kind of stuff, you know? Turns out that was the number one console, so I wouldn't put it past them. But, so here's our product, and then there's theirs. So it's very similar. We're enabling multi-screens to interact with each other in real time, and create all kinds of uh, gaming experiences. And of course, this doesn't have to be just games, right? Uh, this can be applied to many uh, user experiences or many verticals that make sense for it. But games, I think, tend to be uh, the most obvious choice. Um, and also, they, they're one of the things that tends to break grounds in terms of, of UX. So. Right now we're at kind of an interesting point in history. We have digital signs and digital displays like internet-enabled TVs uh, all kind of going through a revolution and including web browsers on them. Also you have tablets, um, smartphones, all of that up there in the upper right corner. Um, those are going through a major revolution too. Cell phones are no longer the little flip phones that have one utility. They're basically little computers that sit in your pocket. We also have Web games and mobile games going through this kind of revolution too. Um, I don't think that all games in the future are going to be like Farmville, where it's a little isometric base engines, where it's very simple drag and drop kind of things. Um, I think that they're going to become much more like the consoles. And same goes for the mobile platforms. So which brings us to the brass monkey stuff. Let's. I just want to talk about quickly what we currently support. We have. Um, uh, libraries for Objective C, uh, which includes the whole iOS platform. We have Flash. We have HTML5 more recently with our acquisition of a company called Emotely. Um, we also support Android as a mobile platform and uh, Unity and .NET. Uh, and then if you're a hardcore C++ guy or like um, 
you know, like open frameworks and stuff, we also have a C++ library. So who wants to try this stuff out and play some games? All right. So last year you guys probably played the Star Wars Trench Run. Um, I'm going to show you some other stuff real quick. Smuggle Truck. How many of you guys? How many of you guys heard about Smuggle Truck? <laughs> this is one that got banned by the uh, App Store because it was too controversial. It's somewhat offensive. So it can be. So you can either play in a smuggle truck or a snuggle truck. So you can toggle. It's kind of fun. But if you get the app in the app store, the snuggle truck app, you can actually control smuggle truck on your Mac or PC. And these guys are using our libraries. So. so once my phone connects, or connected. Now this turns into kind of a game controller. So who's up? Who wants to play? Anybody? Everybody's shy. Oh yeah. That's awesome. So it becomes a controller? So yeah, it even becomes a menu system too. So you can select um, main screen. Don't play the tutorial. The tutorial is really boring. Hit next and you'll see a flip through the menu on the left. There you go. Just Seem, yeah, see how you're controlling that on the, there you go. Hit play. The level. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> and see, so you hit on that button on the right to go. All right. So let's see if my, I gotta check and see if this Android has enough power to even play right now. Oh, it doesn't. Oh, no, it, it's turning on. So in the meantime, I'll show you some other stuff. How many of you guys have seen a Star Wars Trench Run game? A few of you guys? All right, well, we might as well play it then, if not that many of you have hit it. So this is actually available online at uh, StarWars.com, and this is a browser-based game too, so you can see, you can play it right in the browser. Um, unfortunately, THQ lost their license, uh, the Star Wars brand, so we're working on a solution to get that back up there. So you can't get it new, but if you already have the game, you can still use this feature. So there, it detected my device, I connect to it, and then we can play. Who wants to shoot some TIE fighters? All right. Here, grab this. All right. We can either have you fly down the trench or... I'll give you this first level first. Uh, okay, stay sharp. Actually, hit the pause button real quick. I'll put you on full screen. It's way cooler. All right, there you go. Hit pause when you're ready. Yeah, so this is the first game we actually released uh, that used a Brass Monkey SDK. Um, and this was kind of the, almost the first prototype that we did to use it. So we don't have the full on menu controls from it. Um, like you can't select the game menus and everything. But this is something we're planning on adding at some point in the near future to this particular game.
All right, let's let's show him some other level real quick. We get to uh, get to see some more levels here. <laughs> Your mission was a failure. It's terrible. Actually, let's do a run down the trench in the um, Millennium Falcon. You want to hand that over to somebody else and give it a try? Wants to try. Yeah, let Reggie play it. Oh yeah. So your goal here is to shoot the cannons before they shoot you. They'll be coming up very soon. This looks cool on this big screen. <laughs> it's the power of unity in this graphics. It's incredible. There's one. Kill that one. Oh! <laughs> Alright, who in the audience is an Android fan? Likes Android a lot. You gamer too? Yeah, come on up. You're gonna race the boat in this one. Unfortunately, I can't hand it to you back there because I didn't charge my in, my uh, Nexus One before coming. It was my fault. But so it has to run tethered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you get this one. All right, I'm gonna cut you off. Now you're gonna have to play something else. All right. Can I see my phone? <laughs> All right. Let's see what else we got here. All right, so this, this game is called Rival Racers. Um, basically, the idea with this is that it's uh, Android versus iPhone, and uh, it's a boat race. So, yeah, you can either stand here and watch this screen or the other one. Turn it around. So who wants to play iPhone? Let's go. Bring All it right, on. Bring it on, man. Come on up. <laughs> so. Definitely looking at the big screen. What's that? Yeah, so this should turn it to, it should anyway. I, I don't know why it's not connecting. Maybe I got jumped. I might have gotten knocked off the network. Hold on. I probably got knocked off the network. Sorry. Yeah, you should be able to hit the um, accelerator button. Just see if that works. And see if you can drive that around while I get this guy connected. Hmm. For some reason the iPhone doesn't want to connect. Yeah. Alright. One way to go over, I guess. <laughs> Technical difficulties, hold on a second. Hold on. That should go back to the main screen again here shortly. Let's try that one more time. I might have had the wrong rival racers. I don't think so though. Doo -doo -doo. Oh, I have to hit play. There we go. Now you know what it is?
Alright, if this doesn't work if this doesn't work this time, I'm just gonna give up, but it should work. There we go. Alright, so hit the accelerator. There you go. You got the Apple you have the Apple boat on the right and this gentleman here has the Android. So. Android. Keep up the good work, man. Don't overcorrect. <laughs> it's like some drunk boat racing going on here or something. <laughs> Yeah, this is another Unity game. So I'm showing all Unity games right now. Uh, yeah, this uh, soundtrack is actually done by John Gurdon. I don't know if you guys know John Gurdon. He's a Flash developer and drummer. Oh. <laughs> Nice flip, though. That was a 360, I think. All right, up here, you guys are going to have to dive to get underneath that cave there. There you go. So we demoed this at the CES conference, the Consumer Electronics Show in Vegas. Um, and it was a big hit. We showed this on a split screen uh, tabletop game, and uh, you know people could walk up to it and play it using their phones. Yeah. So once again, this uh, this software development kit works over a Wi-Fi network. While while these guys are playing, I might as well tell you a little bit about what we're doing here. So it, one of the requirements is it uses a Wi-Fi network. And um, it, all the connections are happening uh, as in a peer-to-peer -peer way, connecting directly to the game, either running in a web browser or standalone. And um, we do that using, and all of that stuff is abstracted to the developer, so that you don't have to know how to do uh, any of that stuff. You basically get the libraries, and it's an event-based API. You just listen for events to come in, um, kind of like accelerometer events or uh, button pushes or you know touch, we we all of that just comes back in. Uh oh, did you get stuck? Oh wait, you got out of it. Oh okay. Well, Android dies because it's out of batteries. So I think we got the point. No, no, you're back in, but I think at this point you lost it. So thank you very much. Thanks, guys, for playing. All right. So I kind of got into a little bit of how it works because I didn't want to run out of time. This is only a 45 minute session, of course. So it does work on Wi-Fi. We chose Wi-Fi because a lot of devices support it. Um, it has a better range than Bluetooth and um, it'll run right in a web browser. Bluetooth, you can't actually do that kind of thing. Um, so Wi-Fi is everywhere. Even this little uh, thing probably has a Wi-Fi hotspot. Um, and we also use TCP and UDP uh, sockets uh, that run in parallel. We kind of call that a smart sockets. Um, not that you need to know too much about it, but uh, it does mean that it's an extremely efficient communication layer. And as I mentioned before, it's an event-based API. So you just hook up uh, um, you know, listeners for the events in whatever language you're actually developing for. So in C Sharp, you know, you kind of have like the old style of delegates like you used to have in ActionScript 2, or at least for Unity, and uh, you listen for those. In ActionScript, you set up proper uh, uh, listeners for that. Um, so we can look at some code. Um, well, how are we doing on time, anyway? Anybody? Four. Four. So I'm supposed to be done in 15 minutes. How many of you guys are programmers here? Yeah, the vast majority of you. Okay, so maybe we should look at code. <laughs> I just didn't want to bore the hell out of you if you weren't interested. Uh, yeah. Now we get to watch a clip start up on my MacBook Air, which isn't blazingly fast. 
So I'll show you, I'll show you quickly um, kind of a flash example. Since I don't have access to the internet right now, um, for some reason they were blocking some ports on here or something. I, I can't actually run this, but this would be good enough to kind of show you uh, an example of how the Brass Monkey event structure works. So this is ActionScript code. I assume a lot of you guys are Flash guys or know ActionScript. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, so here's the, this is the main function that gets called once the Flux project is loaded up, right? And so in this case, what we're doing is um, tracking inputs from a lot of people and then displaying some kind of a graphic on the thing. It's more like a drawing app, as you can imagine. So. When I touch on my device, you'll see it show up on the screen. Somebody else touches on theirs, it'll show up on the screen. So, um, so here, here's where you set up, um, you set up the registry, um, and this basically tracks your uh, device. Uh, I mean, your specific um, app ID. It's kind of like setting up a namespace. And then here you set up a device manager, and then you listen for the event. So here we have a discovered event, and we have a connected event, and a disconnected event. You map those to some methods. So let's see what happens when you discover an event. Might as well expand this so I don't have to keep doing that. There we go. So you get a device event and inside of that it's got a list of devices and then all you have to do we've actually removed the, necess the necessity of doing this load policy file right now um, but you just connect to the device and then once that device is connected it'll trigger that other event which is the if I can find it on device connected you guys following me so far? This is actually really simple stuff, uh, hopefully. Um, touches received, or so, so you get a, um, another event back from this, and this holds all the um, things from the device itself, and you can map these actual events to other things like touches, accelerometer, and shake events. So let's look at the touch event real quick, because this is one of the more complicated ones. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the this is the application on the screen. Once again, sorry, because I don't have the internet application, I can't actually run it for you. But it's basically you're going to see like fireworks pop up on the screen when you touch somewhere on one of the other devices. So yeah, this is the this is the, what we term the host side. So it's like the either the game or the app or whatever the experience is that's showing up on the large screen. So um, touches come in. And as there's multiple touches and we support multi-touch, um, you have a dictionary of all of these touches right here. And then you kind of loop through them and then look for the different phases. And then you can do stuff with them. It's really as simple as that. Now we also do support a button uh, behavior as well. So all you have to do is hit, listen for button events and that's a lot simpler than looking, tracking where and position the actual uh, button is or and all of that kind of stuff. So that's essentially it. The other uh, events work exactly the same way. Accelerometer comes back with a three-axis, uh, you know, uh, X, Y, Z coordinates, and, and um, the other ones are kind of work in a very similar way. You can also push messages back to the phone or the other devices as well, and I can show you some of that later too. All right, so that's kind of a brief overview of that. But um, we're, we're about ready to announce a brand new thing, which is uh, going to be launching next week. And like I had mentioned earlier, this is some free stuff. And what we're making is called the Seriously Fun Controller. And this app uh, is going to be available in the App Store for uh, iPhone, Android, uh, hopefully BlackBerry, and uh, you know all the other ones as well pretty soon. And then... Uh, what you can do is you can develop to this controller and create the control schemes for it for free and um, there's other stuff coming with this as well. Uh, we're going to have a, a website or essentially kind of a game portal or almost like an app store uh, which you can control from the phone uh, once you have the seriously fun controller. You can flip through, just sit on your couch and then play games and hopefully these are games that you guys create or people like you guys. Um, so you can imagine it's kind of like a ranking system. You know, we'll see the top games that are played the most. And there will be um, 
a revenue stream with this too, which I haven't um, showed you yet, but I'll, I'll kind of get into that first. But let me show you quickly um, how this works with Unity at the moment. How many of you guys have worked with Unity? A few of you back there, okay. I don't, I don't think this will be too foreign for most of you guys. But. Maybe I should kill Eclipse while I do that. All right. Okay, so this is a... Um, I'm actually going to show you a quite different one. This is a mobile layout editor which we're going to be shipping with us. This is going to be available in the Unity Asset Store when we ship the product. And uh, you can get this for free, and you can set up buttons, move them around, and everything. But I'm going to show you a multiplayer example first. Split screen. This is kind of one of the things that gets shipped with the game. Um, and you can see here that we have a ball on the left that's red, and then a green ball on the right. right? And when we bring up the controls for this guy, You'll see that it's kind of got this gas pedal thing, and this you can move the the buttons around. You can also add um, different profiles for different size devices. So you know, iPad or you know, different resolutions, 1024 by 768, for example, Retina screen, and then uh, all the various things that um, other devices will have different sizes. So it'll display the right. Uh, uh, control scheme when you actually connect with the device. So let me just show you quickly. So like I said, this is calling the on Excel function for Accelerate. And then this guy, which you would think would be a break, uh, we're re reusing the controls here, <laughs> uh, but it actually calls on jump and it makes the ball jump. And so I can show you in the code where this calls uh, in your game, uh, but you know it's pretty simple. You basically kind of register your class as, uh, as the main event for the controllers to hit. And then once you do that, you just listen for those events and you can do cool stuff with it. So let me show you real quick. U using the Android, I'm mean, sorry, using the iPhone and my trusty iPad 1. Cool. Who wants to drive some balls around? <laughs> oh, yeah, see, it detected this one because I started this one up. And once I connect this guy, you'll see that the iPad shows up as well. Anybody want to try it? Here, Todd, you can tr control one of them. Ugh. There you go. So all we have to do is connect these devices. Let's do that real quick. Confirm connection. And I think I saw a bug. Damn it. <laughs> All right. Let's try that again. Sorry, guys. This is still kind of an early build of this, so bear with me. I'm sure you guys as software developers can understand that. <laughs> mm. There we go. And Okay, so let's connect the iPad first. Did that push the control scheme down to it? Okay, cool, so that guy's connected. Oh my god, all right, so I think we have a definite, oh, uh, is that what happened? All right, well, never mind. I think you guys get the idea here. I'm not gonna go into this now. Damn bugs. All right. Sorry, that was pretty exciting. Not. <laughs> ah, 
But the, the, the main thing to take away from this, though, is that we're creating a way for developers to create uh, their own controllers. And we're going to make it free for developers to use. Uh, we're starting out with Unity, but then we're going to quickly add Flash, HTML5 as well. And then uh, starting with iOS, uh, but then Android will become quickly after that. And we're looking at other platforms, too. Um, so as you saw, we have a WYSIWYG control edit editor, or kind of the visual control editor. We'll have that for each of the platforms. And then the, the cool thing about this is a revenue share, uh, which we're going to be launching after the initial launch. And the way the revenue share works, you guys remember the old arcade games, right? Where you'd go up and put a coin in it, and you would get to play a game. It's going to be very similar. So when you connect to the game, some, you can set the price for your game using our virtual currency. So people will be able to get the currency through the App Store, just kind of straight up in-app purchases in the uh, controller. And then uh, at that point, they can connect to your game. They drop a few coins into your game. You get to keep that, um, at least a half the revenue for that. And then uh, you, know, you can cash out later. Uh, the other cool things we're going to be doing this, uh, with this are like adding an API uh, for you to actually give back to the players. So like they get a bonus or something like that or hit a level up. You can give them you know, a coin back or whatever. So uh, does this make sense? Do you guys have any questions about that? So the cool thing about this is it, it's enabling you to create multiplayer, um, you know, shared screen experience, sit in front of your couch kind of style game like the game consoles. Um, you can do this right on the web. And the beauty is that you're now able to pretty much compete directly with the consoles uh, because this is a similar experience. And eventually down the line, we also see these kind of things happening in bars and restaurants as well where you can see a screen on the wall, get the seriously fun controller, connect to it, and bam, you're out playing with, you know, maybe it's a silly little tennis game or something where you're playing against somebody. All right, so what else can Brass Monkey be used for and all the stuff that we've made? Um, obviously, you can control physical things. So in this case, I'm thinking of a club. You join the club, you get the app for the club, and you can start controlling the lights. So imagine you know, having an Arduino chip on the computer, which actually will trigger lights and, and change them as you go. Just random ideas. Uh, this is a, the latest casino in Vegas. It's called the Cosmopolitan. Anybody been there or seen it or heard about it? Yeah, it's pretty cool, right? This is the lobby. They have interactive screens. right? In the, uh, it's not interactive right now, but the screens are like these, uh, I think they're called Tiffany... Um, micro tiles or something like that. Uh, but these things are brilliant, man. They, they, they show video in real time. And so I can just imagine being able to walk up to it with your phone and being able to interact with these things in a really cool way. Maybe it's like a virtual concierge that pops up and you know can push coupons to your phone, all kinds of varieties of things. Of course, digital billboards. Um, all of these things are actually, you know, they, they typically use the internet to deliver the um, content on the signs. And so all you need to do is set up a Wi-Fi hotspot there and allow people to connect to it and do cool stuff. I know there was a company um, out in Sweden that just did a really cool thing like this. So a lot of people are thinking this way already, which is great. Um, also, classroom or like conference experiences, like where you're having voting, uh, that's a typical uh, use case that we see happening a lot. That's non-gaming. Um, also, robots and uh, toys. Uh, how many of you guys have seen the AR drone? Have you seen that? You can control it like using your iPhone. So we can create the same type of things using our APIs, or you guys can if you get them. So that's it for me, I guess. Anybody have any specific questions now? And where am I on time? Yeah, what's up in the back? Yeah, so um, it can be. <laughs> and so in the case of the seriously fun controller, that's exactly the way it works. It pushes the control screen down to the um, to the device, and then you can have multiple apps on on the web or or somewhere else that you're connecting with that same controller to it. Um, but you can also have a set um, amount of controls on the on a separate app, and then it it doesn't necessarily get any information from the screen and you can do it separately like that too.
So it just depends on what makes the most sense for your app. Yeah, go ahead. Mike. How are your environments, like scenery and stuff, how does that make? So all of the environments uh, that you saw in those games, those are all done with Unity. Uh, they, the, they have a terrain editor for like um, the trees and all of that stuff. And then uh, most of them are actually made in Maya. I mean, if you, if you haven't looked at um, Unity, you should definitely check out its uh, kind of the way it works with uh, importing the assets. Basically, you make a change in Maya and then it immediately gets updated in the IDE and Unity. Um, Unity is pretty sick. It's, uh, and I think it's really going to be cool when they um, export the molehill because now nobody will have an excuse why they can't um, put it up on their site. Although that's becoming less of a, an issue. You know, you got guys as big as uh, Cartoon Network and uh, um, Lucasfilm and uh, Disney are all putting up Unity games on their sites now. Um, yeah, go ahead. How is this different from FMS? How is this different than FMS? Okay, well, um, FMS, you can actually create uh, connected experiences over the internet like this. Um, so you can actually use it in conjunction with that. But the point of this is low latency controls um, in a peer-to-peer -peer local network. Um, now, with that said, you can actually use RTMFP for a very similar kind of thing. Um, so, uh, but then in that case, you're you're relying on that server to actually route the devices as well. Uh, go ahead. So, do you guys have a non local host solution in mind, or are you have situations where you can't get on the same Wi Fi network? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. We're planning on adding some stuff for like a server-side solution to that, but the, the issue you're going to run into with that is uh, latency. And so it'll work fine for some kind of experiences in some games, and maybe it's trivia or something where you don't need, you know, instant response, but, you know, Twitch-style, like uh, arcade games and stuff like that, you really need to have that peer-to-peer -peer local connection. Um, but we're definitely looking at solutions to it. Um, they, they're also looking at ways to kind of like using NFC, as phones start to add that kind of stuff, you could actually have it set up the Wi-Fi network directly once you tap the thing at a location, for example, and then you'd be right into the experience. Um, the other way we're looking at dealing with this uh, in terms of location-based stuff, where you need to get people to join a Wi-Fi network, um, you just have it on the sign, say, join, uh, you know, Blue Frog, let's say that's the name of <laughs> the app. Join the Blue Frog Network, and then once they do that, instead of it being like a Star War, uh, sorry, a Starbucks type uh, scenario where you get prompted with a login screen, that login screen will just have a link to the app, and you get the app right there, and you're already connected to the network, and you're in the experience. So, yeah, go ahead. Is there any kind of um, mirroring baked in? Like, I, like I understand you guys are focused on gaming, but uh, mm -hmm. the remote controls are like IPT. Your app would be on the local Wi-Fi network. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, we we actually are working on a project. I can't announce who it is right now, but we're we're doing kind of video streaming peer to peer um, using our protocol. So it can do that. Uh, there's so many different ways to kind of spin this, and that's part of the trick as a business too, is to figure out which ones you pick. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's extremely flexible and we can do all kinds of things. And in fact, controlling video on the web is one of the uh, biggest use cases we see after gaming. Definitely. Um, I'm probably running out of time. Let's see what we got here. Anybody else have any other questions? Okay, great. Well, um, thank you very much. Sorry for running over. And if you guys have questions later, find me. Um, I'm pretty easy to spot. I have this hat on. So, All right, thanks. And my contact information is up here. The licensing, uh, you can talk to John too if you want. So.